Have you or a loved one been diagnosed with video game nostalgia? Well, don't fret. We've come up with a revolutionary new way to play the classic video games you're feeling nostalgic for. Just plop down at your PC, boot up Project 64, and you'll be well on your way to scratching that nostalgic itch. Bro, I... I can't see. Emulators! The dirtiest word that's ever come out of my mouth. They have a very strange reputation within gaming circles, with some gamers using them almost exclusively, and others sacrificing anyone who dares boot up Dolphin to the Nintendo deities. But love them or hate them, they're here, and there's nothing anybody can do to stop them. I figured that with how prevalent and controversial they are, I should at least talk about them. I myself have changed my thoughts and opinions on them a handful of times, especially with how they relate to making content here on YouTube. So while this video exists to help me share my thoughts on the matter, it's also to help me figure out what exactly my thoughts are. Seriously, when I started writing the script, it was just a pros and cons list to emulator use, and it just kind of evolved from there. First and foremost, I think it's important to talk about what emulators I've used and have experience with. And truth be told, it's all Nintendo emulators. I mean, look at me, is that really surprising? The very first emulator I ever got my hands on, I had to literally get my hands on. GBA for iOS was a Game Boy Advance emulator meant for iOS devices. Wow, what a creative name. Who'd ever known? This emulator existed a long time ago and has recently been folded into the Delta emulator, but I have very fond memories of playing multiple GBA games on my silly little iPod Touch on the bus rides to and from middle school. It was certainly illegitimate, not being sold on the Apple App Store and requiring a fair bit of, uh, dubious fiddling to get downloaded onto Apple devices. Even now, the new Delta emulator can only be downloaded through nefarious third-party means, and the original GBA for iOS straight up doesn't work on phones past iOS 8, from 2014. After that, I didn't mess with emulators until fairly late into high school, where I downloaded Project 64, a Nintendo 64 emulator, onto my school-loaned MacBook. I had to use another program called Wine to do it, since Project 64 isn't made for Mac, and Wine allows Macs to run Windows software, so it wasn't exactly an efficient setup. But, hey, I got it to work. Barely. For, like, a year before I graduated. Thankfully, now I have a PC, and have access to a ton of different emulators, including Project 64, meaning I can now emulate Star Fox with no issues. Moving to college with a PC also got me started with Desmume, a Nintendo DS emulator many people watching me probably familiar with. Let's be real, I know y'all are here because of the Mystery Dungeon Randomizer series. I started that series with Desmume and used it for a while, but fairly recently swapped over to a different DS emulator called Melon DS, which just works so much better. Desmume is the more popular of the two, but it has so many compatibility issues with a lot of games, and the way it handles graphics is kind of a mess. Thankfully, both are issues I don't have to worry about with Melon DS. Also, because I didn't know where else to put this mention, uh, I used Melon DS to record the entirety of the Pokemon Mystery Dungeon Randomizer series that I competed with Minish May in. She's uploading the entire race as videos to her channel, so if you've been missing some of that PMD gameplay goodness, I highly advise checking that series out over there. It was an absolute blast to record. And apparently life gives you lot, bunny. When life gives you lot bunny, make lot bunny juice. Ew. Wait, no, hold on. Please that, don't no, do that. That idea. <laughs> Link in the description and in the top right card. You know how this works. I have a little bit of experience with the Citra emulator, which emulates a Nintendo 3DS. Uh, I use this for the Gates to Infinity randomizer series, and I have a few games I want to play with it. I just haven't gotten around to it quite yet. And of course, to top off the PC emulators, I've been using the Dolphin emulator a fair bit recently in large part because I love Wii-era games, and Dolphin is designed to emulate both a GameCube and a Wii, so it's a two-for-one special. I do need to specify PC emulators, because there are a few other emulators I use from time to time that aren't on the PC, most notably the NES and SNES emulators available on the Switch as part of the Nintendo Switch Online subscription service, which I am subscribed to. I don't boot them up very often, but I do every now and then to pass the time. I am going to be including them in my discussion of emulators going forward because, yes, they are emulators. They are built from the ground up to emulate older software, alongside the Nintendo 64 and Sega Genesis emulators included with the expansion package that I don't have. I know that they're not what most people think of when we talk about emulators, because they are official programs created and sold by the company that made the console being emulated. However, I don't think that really matters in the long run. 
as official emulators can have the same benefits and deficits as unofficial ones, while also having a few benefits and deficits of their own, which I will be talking about going forward. Also, I do have a Virtual Boy emulator installed onto my MetaQuest 2, but I don't think anybody cares about that. Now, you might notice something. I actually own some of the consoles I use emulators for. I have a Wii and a GameCube. I just realized that the lighting is so bad back <laughs> you, you could kind of see the GameCube like right here, but you, the, the Wii is right here. It's just black. It's blending in. Hold on. Can you see my Wii? It's right there. I have a Wii, a GameCube, and a 3DS that can play DS games. I don't have a Game Boy Advance or Nintendo 64 anymore, mainly because my family lost or sold them back in the day. But even when I had those, I was still using unofficial emulators. I had a GBA all through high school, but I still wound up using GBA for iOS fairly often when it was available. Same thing with my Nintendo 64. It was lost or sold when I went to college, but I was using Project 64 before that. So, that obviously leads to a question of why? Straight up, the number one answer to that question is convenience. It is mind-bogglingly useful to have all your games and emulators on a single device that you already use for other purposes. For the most part. I have to add that stipulation because when it comes to the convenience of initial setup, consoles take the cake. All you have to do is plug the console into a TV, plug it into a power source, press the power button, and boom! The console's walking you through the initial process. And it rarely ever takes more than two to three minutes. Meanwhile, setting up emulators can be about as painful as an XL Bad Dragon. Just with installation, there are a ton of different versions to consider. Sometimes the most recent version has features you want to use, but bugs you don't want to risk. You can spring for a beta or developmental version, which means that you'd be updating it fairly regularly to somewhat untested builds, or you could spring for a stable version which hasn't been updated in years. Not to mention, once an emulator is actually installed, setting it up can be painful. Some emulators of more recent consoles, such as the Nintendo Switch emulators, Ryujinx, and Yuzu, require extra files that you can only access by extracting from a modded version of that console. Plus, with every emulator, there are a ton of settings you have to dive into in order to get things going. You're required to set up a control scheme, configure your performance and graphics settings, specify your ROM directory, make sure you actually have ROMs that are compatible with the emulator, and let's be clear, these are mandatory steps that you must do when setting up each and every emulator you use. There's a reason there are so many video tutorials out there telling you how to set up every emulator in existence. However, despite all the inconvenience of setup, emulators still take the cake when it comes to convenience overall. Once you've gotten everything started and configured exactly how you like, emulators just work. All you have to do is select the game you want to play and start playing. No need to search for the proper disc or cartridge, which might have been lost behind the couch cushions. All your games are saved right there in a pretty easy to find folder that you specify. Plus, it's convenient that you can have multiple emulators with you at the same time. If I want to switch between my actual GameCube, Wii, Wii U, or Switch, I have to make sure each console is plugged into my TV correctly, sometimes unplugging one to make space on the composite port or HDMI port for another. Well, for emulators, it's as simple as... I don't need to do anything to change the games or consoles available to me at any time. I can have whatever consoles and games I want with me anywhere I have my laptop, phone, or switch. And that is extremely useful. Seriously, the amount of time I spent playing Smash 64 in class without my professors noticing is actually embarrassing. Plus, there is a bonus level of convenience that only streamers and content creators really need to think about. And that's how easy a console is to get footage of. With pretty much every physical console, you're going to need some extra bit of hardware called a capture card to record or stream footage of the console. And those can cost a very pretty penny. The HDMI Elgato capture card I have costs around $200. And while I still believe it's a worthwhile investment that makes getting Switch and Wii U footage fairly convenient, because it's an HDMI capture card, it can only capture HDMI consoles. There are a ton of consoles and devices with a variety of different video and audio output formats, and each format you get a capture card for is another chunk of money down the drain. And then, of course, there are handheld consoles that were never meant to have any external form of video output aside from their own screens. If you want to capture footage of them, 
you have to physically install a capture card into the console, which is a pretty high-risk mod that could sometimes result in your Game Boy or DS being completely bricked. Or... For content creators, it is significantly more convenient to emulate most consoles, because suddenly you don't need to spend anything to record or stream the footage you need. All you need is the computer you're already using for content. So, yeah, in terms of convenience, while emulators might be a struggle to set up, they are astoundingly easier to access, and they're so much better for content than actual consoles. Overall, convenience is the first thing I consider when talking about emulation. It is extremely important to me. However, it's far from the only thing to think about when talking about emulators. There are a ton of other factors to consider, including... Performance is arguably the single most important thing to think about when it comes to emulators, more so than convenience for many people. And it's a struggle because depending on what you're emulating and what device you're using to emulate, it could either be a pretty good thing or a really, really bad thing. By definition, an emulator basically takes everything that makes a console work, both hardware and software, and tries to run it entirely inside a digital environment. Video game consoles are incredibly complex, so naturally trying to take an entire console and have it run on a computer is a really difficult task. This means that, unfortunately, a lot of emulators have horrendous performance on lower-end devices. Whenever you use an emulator, your CPU and GPU are working hard not only to make your device run, but also to make an entirely separate device run inside of it. It's kind of like if you were lifting weights at the gym, but also you're pregnant and the fetus inside you is also lifting weights. Fetuses aren't supposed to be lifting weights. How did the weights even get in there? You're playing games on a device they were absolutely not intended for, which means that you are completely at the whim of what your device is capable of. Most normal work or school PCs probably don't have the processing power to emulate anything well, so even trying to emulate the GameCube or a PS2 could lead to some brutal performance issues. Low frame rates, extreme amounts of stutter, and cooling systems going wild trying to keep your device from exploding can ruin a gaming experience. So for a lot of people without high-end gaming PCs, the poor performance of emulators can be a huge detriment to the idea of emulation. Thankfully, a lot of modern emulators have fairly large teams of developers working together to add any optimizations they can without damaging the gameplay of the emulator. Things like uber shaders, approximated anti-aliasing, improved polygon splitting, whatever that means. They're all neat little tricks included by emulators to make the emulation just work better. This has definitely lowered the bar of entry for a lot of emulators, meaning you don't need a truly high-end PC, you just need something that's not garbage. Dolphin's been running pretty smoothly on most Android phones since 2018, which leads to a point that emulator performance can sometimes be better than the consoles they're emulating. Now, I don't want to start a fight, but... Nintendo consoles aren't perfect. Hey! On. Video game consoles have existed since the 1970s, and clearly technology has improved a boatload. While on some devices emulators don't run very well, on others it's entirely possible for the emulator to perform better than the actual console. So many of those extra little improvements added to each emulator increases performance beyond what the original console is capable of. A lot of issues with frame drops and other performance bugs can be fixed with emulators. In Super Mario 64, for instance, Dire Dire Docks causes enormous amounts of lag on the official Nintendo 64, causing speedrunners to have to position their camera really carefully in order to avoid lag. When emulating the game, however, you could just choose to increase the memory size and boom, no more lag. This isn't just true of old consoles though, even modern consoles such as the 3DS and Switch perform worse than the emulators for them. Citroen Yuzu. A lot of people often complain about lag on the Switch, especially with resource-heavy games like Xenoblade and Monster Hunter, but when emulating them, those issues just go away. If you have the right specs and right settings, of course. This is why performance is so important to think about when it comes to emulation. Thankfully, with official emulators like the NSO library or the Wii U Virtual Console, you don't really have to worry about it because Nintendo only publishes games for those emulators that they know can perform well. Usually. But for at-home emulation, it can be tricky to know if emulation is a good option. You have to know what your machine is capable of. And if you don't have good enough specs, mm, tough luck, Chuckle Nuts! But when you do have enough processing power to get an emulator for one of your favorite consoles or games running smoothly, it feels 
so good not to have to worry about the performance faults of the original console. It also feels really good not to have to worry about... This is going to be a bit of a shorter section because graphics aren't really at the forefront of my mind. I mean, look at me. I'm a Nintendo fan. I don't really care about graphical quality. However, graphics are still a pretty big benefit to emulation. Much like how some emulators can perform better than the original consoles, most emulators can also look phenomenal. Because of how consoles work, they have to run at a preset internal resolution and then blow their pictures up to fill whatever screen you're playing them on. Naturally, this means that older consoles like the GameCube really don't look good when plugged into modern TVs. Honestly, even the Nintendo Switch, which has a maximum internal resolution of 1080p, looks pretty iffy on monitors with higher resolutions like 4K. Emulators don't have to worry about that though. Emulating the entire console means that they can just change the internal resolution of the console, letting you adjust it to be whatever looks best on your screen. Again, as a Nintendo fan, this wasn't something I valued too much. Until recently. I made a video on the long-lost Japanese-only WiiWare Pokemon Mystery Dungeon Adventure Squad games, and it's a video I'm pretty proud of. I wanted to play through the game on original hardware, too, so I went through a whole process of modding my Wii U to allow for the installation of a patched Wii ROM, only for it to look like... this. Keep in mind, this was running on a Wii U, a console designed to output 1080p graphics, and I was recording at 1080p off my HDMI capture card. By all accounts, this should have looked really good. But I really wish I ultimately decided to record it all using Dolphin instead, because when using an emulator, I could get the games to perfectly render at the exact resolution I was recording at. I mean, this looks far better. Maybe it's just the gripe that content creators face. Like I said, most Nintendo fans don't really care about graphics, and I haven't gotten any comments on that video roasting me for how bad the game footage looks, so it's pretty clear most of you don't care. But it just bothers me to know how the game could have looked. And also know that running it on official hardware didn't even come close. Oh, and on top of that, some emulators let you run custom texture packs, or run some sort of filter over the textures so games look even better than they would using built-in textures. Again, I don't personally care too much about it. I didn't even know this was possible until I saw Pav's video tutorial on how to run a 3DS Monster Hunter game with 4K textures that I realized... Okay, wow, custom textures are pretty valuable. Honestly, I thought the high-res texture packs were something exclusive to, like, Minecraft. I don't know, I'm pretty stupid. However, custom texture packs of course lead me to my next minor point being... There are a lot of game mods out there, and emulation just makes it a whole lot easier. For PC games, modding can sometimes be as simple as just dragging a file you downloaded online into the right folder. For console modding... None of these words are in the Bible. Modding a console in and of itself is pretty dang complicated. Remember all that setup convenience of consoles I was talking about at the beginning of the video? Well, throw that out the window if you want to play a randomizer or something. It's complex, it takes a ton of time, and it introduces a boatload of risk because if you mess up once, it could break your console and make it completely unplayable. Seriously, for that Adventure Squad video I made, I was constantly consulting the Homebrew Guide and the Wii U modding Discord community because there were so many ways everything could just go wrong. With emulation, however, it's usually as easy to mod a ROM as it is to play one vanilla. Every ROM hacking guide in existence assumes you're playing with an emulator, and applying a mod or patch to a ROM is about as simple as saying, okay, here's the game, and here's the mod. Now kiss. Thus, emulation opens the doors to a ton of new experiences you just can't have on actual consoles. Or, you can theoretically have it, but most of the time it's just not worth the effort. Funnily enough, this is actually something official emulators dabble in from time to time. While they don't open their games up to fan-made mods, the Switch Online emulators have some special editions of the games that are modded in slight ways, usually unlocking late-game content at the very beginning of the game. I have no idea why they decided to do this. A retextured version of Super Mario World isn't quite as cool as an entire Kaizo ROM hack you can play at home, but you know what? Sure. Ah yes, the last point to cover with emulation, and the one that always causes the most controversy, piracy. One of the biggest arguments against all the upsides of emulation is that it encourages illegally downloading games, also known as piracy. And you know what? It's true, emulation absolutely encourages piracy. Now, emulation itself isn't piracy. In fact, they've been defended in US courts multiple times, meaning that, at least in the United States, 
they are a completely legal way to play games you've legally acquired. However, the actual process of acquiring ROMs legally is incredibly difficult and risky, and could lead to you bricking an official console if you mess it up. Piracy, while also a bit risky as you have to worry about viruses and broken ROMs, is far more convenient than acquiring game files legally. It's much easier to just go to some website, download a ROM, and start playing it illegally than it is to rip your games legitimately. For anyone turning to emulation for the sake of convenience, which is most people, that convenience encourages more convenience, which encourages piracy. I have mixed feelings on piracy personally. On one hand, it's a way to play games that aren't officially available for purchase anymore, and helps prevent you from paying $20,000 that wouldn't be going to the game's creators anyway. On the other hand, it's objectively illegal, and can also be a way to steal a person or company's creations without giving them the money they rightly deserve. It's a very difficult gray area where if you encourage piracy for old games by massive corporations, you're also encouraging piracy for new games by indie teams that could really use your financial support. Not to mention how piracy comes with a lot of risks. Risks that can absolutely be avoided with care and education, but risks that many people without the proper care and education unnecessarily take constantly. I've seen a lot of people struggle with having downloaded viruses and faulty versions of games because they didn't know what they were doing. They just wanted to play Super Mario Galaxy 2 and decided to pirate it because Nintendo decided not to put it in Mario 3D All-Stars for some reason! Don't ask me how I know multiple people who have experienced that exact same, extremely specific issue. Look, in truth, piracy is something only you can really decide where you stand on it. You could be noble and call it a way to preserve games as all things physical will eventually fail. You could be chaotic and say you don't care about the profits of video game creators, you just want to play games for free. You could be lawful and only play games you legally paid for. But either way, it's a thing that's going to happen and is going to be encouraged by emulation. It's kind of like sex. Fairly risky without the proper education, and you can choose to avoid it if you want, but other people are going to continue doing it anyway. So, that's it! That's all I have to say about emulators. For me, as a content creator with a fairly high-end PC who doesn't have to worry about performance issues and highly values convenience, I think they have far more pros than cons. But for others, those cons of encouraging piracy and not performing perfectly on some devices might not make them worth it. It's all up to you. Now if you excuse me, reading those Switch homebrew instructions gave me a migraine, so I'm gonna go take a nap. This is what napping looks like.